Thank you very much. Those of you who have read Naked Economics know that I have a tenuous connection to math and that these books were written in part out of desperation. So I was having a drink earlier with Don Peck, who was a grad student with me, and we were reflecting on how we struggled in some of our economics and stats classes. Naked Economics was written almost by accident in the sense that I had been assigned a class to teach economics to journalists. I called my agent. I was unsuccessfully trying to sell a book on the gambling industry. <laughs> Never got that one done. There's, there's a good book to be written. And I said to her, look, i got to teach this economics class to a bunch of journalists. A textbook would be inappropriate. I can't find anything that would just convey why they should care about this that wouldn't consume them with the math and the equations. There was a long pause. And she said, no, you're going to write it. And it's going to be called Economics for Poets. And I'm going to read it. <laughs> and so that's how Naked Economics was born. And once that kind of found a niche among people who'd been scared away or bored to death by economics classes, we said, we being W.W. W. Norton, I, let's go back and let's do statistics, which is in many ways even more mathematically daunting. On the other hand, it's even more ascendant. Economics has kind of always been economics. But statistics, if you think about it, just a couple of things that have happened over the course of everybody's lifetime in this room, you go back 15 years when you, ha you gave someone your credit card and they did that little slide thing and then it went into a bucket somewhere and that was filed somewhere so there, nobody had a digital record of what you'd bought. Computing power was more expensive and more cumbersome. You fast forward now to the point where they'll scan the book, they'll take your credit card data, and I'm actually going to read about how alarming that might become, not necessarily here. <laughs> But the confluence of scanner data, the ability to dig digital digitalize that, and then cheap computing power means that we know more about people than we've ever known, and that data, those data are cheap and easy to manipulate, to use, to study, for good and for ill. So what I thought I'd do tonight is read kind of four short sections. The first is a motivation for the book. This will revisit my uncomfortable relationship with math. It's kind of a funny story here. And then talk about a probability event. Uh, it's older, but it gives you some sense of the power of statistics, how if you really know the underlying math, you can use it for good. I'm going to give you one that I think is kind of a, a wake up in terms of should we all be a little more aware of what's happening with the data that we are throwing out in every direction. And then I'm going to finish. The last chapter of the book is a, bu a bunch of open questions that I think statistics will help to inform, but we don't have full answers yet. One of them, for example, I'm not going to read it, is what's football going to look like in 10 or 15 years with the head trauma and those kinds of things. And there are a lot of statisticians and other researchers using the kinds of methods discussed in the book looking at that question. But I do think there, there are going to be some interesting developments over the near term for that. So let me start with the very, the, this is the introduction of the book. The introduction is called Why I Hated Calculus But Love Statistics. And this is a totally true story. This is the beginning of the book. I've always had an uncomfortable relationship with math. I do not like numbers for the sake of numbers. I am not impressed by fancy formulas that have no real world application. I particularly disliked high school calculus for the simple reason that no one ever bothered to tell me why I needed to learn it. What is the area beneath a parabola? Who cares? <laughs> and now that my daughter is going through it, I still don't care. Uh, <laughs> In fact, one of the great moments of my life occurred during my senior year of high school at the end of the first semester of advanced placement calculus. I was working away in the final exam, admittedly less prepared for the course than I should have been. I'd already been accepted to college a few weeks earlier. So as I stared at the final exam questions, they looked completely unfamiliar. I don't mean that I was having trouble answering them. I mean that I didn't even recognize what I was being asked. I was no stranger to being unprepared for exams, but to paraphrase Don Rumsfeld, I usually knew what I didn't know. <laughs> this exam looked even more Greek than usual. I flipped through the pages of the exam for a while and then more or less surrendered. I walked to the front of the classroom where my calculus teacher, whom we'll call Carol Smith, now in the original draft it said whom we'll call Carol Miller, parentheses, because that's her name, and parentheses, uh, <laughs> The publisher said, we're not going to do that. So uh, Carol Smith was proctoring the exam. 
I said, Mrs. Smith, I do not recognize a lot of the stuff on this exam. Uh, we had a, a contentious relationship at that point, so suffice it to say that Mrs. Smith did not like me a whole lot more than I liked her. Yes, I can now admit that I sometimes use my limited powers as student association president to schedule all school assemblies just so that her class would be canceled. <laughs> yes, my friends and I did have flowers delivered to Mrs. Smith during class from, quote, a secret admirer, end quote, just so we could chortle away in the back to see what would happen. And yes, I did stop doing any homework at all once I got into college. So when I walked up to Mrs. Smith in the middle of the exam and said the material did not look familiar, she was, well, unsympathetic. Charles, she said loudly, ostensibly to me, but she was facing the rows of desks to make sure that the entire class could hear, if you had studied, the material would look a lot more familiar. This was a compelling point. <laughs> So I slunk back to my desk. After a few minutes, Brian Arbutter, and this is his real name because he is <laughs> viewed in a favorable light here, uh, we had these discussions, a far better calculus student than I walked to the front of the room and whispered a few things to Mrs. Smith. She whispered back, and then a truly extraordinary thing happened. Class, I need your attention, Mrs. Smith announced. It appears that I have given you the second semester exam by mistake. <laughs> We were far enough into the test period that the whole exam had to be aborted and rescheduled. I cannot fully describe my euphoria. <laughs> I would go on in life to marry a wonderful woman. We have three healthy children. I've published books and visited places like the Taj Mahal and the Angkor Wat. Still, the day that my calculus teacher got her comeuppance is a top five life moment. <laughs> now, by way of Disclosure, the fact that I nearly failed the makeup exam <laughs> did, not distinguish, did not diminish in any way from this wonderful experience. So that is, that's where I come from when it comes to quantitative exercises. Now, there is a sad footnote to this, which is by the time I got to graduate school, I was feeling a little bit more confident. At this point, I'd gone through math camp, and uh, I kind of was thinking that I was getting my math feet underneath me. So we got, I was at the Woodrow Wilson School, and they had the resources where they could offer most of the econ and stats classes with or without calculus. And you could kind of decide, and by the second semester, I was thinking, you know what, I'm ready for calculus again. I, you know, I'd kind of grown into this. I'd felt really confident. So I took it with calculus, and I kind of got beaten up. And unfortunately, the class without calculus was taught by Ben Bernanke. <laughs> <laughs> So my hubris meant that I did not study macroeconomics with the current Fed chair, uh, which is unfortunate. Um, so uh, that is where I come from. I have in life, because I do public policy and things like that, come to appreciate, obviously, the, the enormous power of these tools and the math. But really, it's about can you tell me why I need to know this? So what I'm going to read now is a section from Chapter 5, which is Basic Probability. The subtitle is Do Not Buy the Extended Warranty on Your $99 Printer. Um, that you can probably figure out. Instead, I'm going to tell you a story that some of you may remember. This makes me seem a little old, but I hope that you recall this. Uh, this is a story that begins the chapter. In 1981, the Joseph Schlitz Brewing Company spent $1.7 million for what appeared to be a shockingly bold and risky marketing campaign for its flagging brand, Schlitz. How many of you even remember Schlitz beer? Okay, that's good, this is good. All right. Uh, so you know the campaign didn't really work, but you might remember that. So uh, it's good for this time of year. At halftime of the Super Bowl, in front of 100 million people around the world, the company broadcast a live taste test pitting Schlitz beer against a key competitor, Michelob. Bolder yet, the company did not pick random beer drinkers to evaluate the two beers. It picked 100 Michelob drinkers. This was the culmination of a campaign that had run throughout the NFL playoffs. There were five live television taste tests in all, each of which had 100 consumers of competing brands, Budweiser, Miller, or Michelob, conduct a blind taste test between their supposed favorite beer and Schlitz. Each of the beer taste-offs was promoted aggressively, just like the playoffs themselves, and it would say, for example, watch Schlitz versus Bud live during the AFC playoffs. 
How many of you remember this? Okay, this is good then. 